The website is dangerandplay.com. Mike, we've got a few minutes here before the first break. I just want to get your take on this because we've been talking about it throughout the entire show. Jill Stein has now announced officially they're going to have or at least file for a recount in Wisconsin. They've raised enough money to do it in Pennsylvania. They're going to raise more money to try and do it in Michigan. Absolutely phenomenal, strangely phenomenal amount of money raised in such a short period of time. Almost double the money raised for her entire presidential campaign for the Green Party. Of course, in Michigan, there, were, there was no electronic voting machine, so why are they investigating that? They're only having a recount in states that Trump won, even though there are states that Hillary won with more narrow margins, and yet there's no recount there whatsoever. Now, I know Bill Mitchell isn't particularly concerned about this. I think you said on Twitter that you don't see this as, as a big issue. Why do you think it's a big deal? It isn't a big deal. I mean, we had a lot of concern about vote fraud before the election. Why do you think that this isn't a big deal? Because they were already caught in Broward County. So we sounded the alarm. Here's what happened in Broward County, Florida. And this is one reason Trump won Florida. There was a secret room. You wouldn't believe this, but a woman signed an affidavit. There was a secret room inside the headquarters of the Secretary of Elections of Broward County where people were caught filling out ballots. They would take ballots and fill them out um, however they wanted. So they were essentially filling out absentee ballots. They already tried to steal the election by um, taking your absentee ballot and filling it out with a different voter. A very courageous whistleblower, a temporary employee, exposed that plot. And then when, the, when it was investigated by law enforcement, they said, oh, what she saw was true. But really, they were just cor correcting ballots that were sent in by military members. So they've, they've already been caught doing it, and we already have evidence that they've been doing it. That's one reason that I'm not especially concerned. But, I mean, isn't, isn't the fact that they've already been caught trying it a reason at least to have observers there, you know, in Michigan, for example, overseeing this process? Couldn't they just do the same thing where they try and introduce a bunch of new ballots and say, oh, these... We didn't see these on election day. We'll have to include them now. Isn't that a possibility? Given that, you know, this has come from people aligned with the Clinton campaign. It's not come directly from Jill Stein. Oh, exactly. Vig we have to be eternally vigilant. That is, a lot of people are making mistakes thinking, oh, Trump won, party time, now we can do whatever we want. We have to be even more vigilant than we have been ever before. So I'm not dismissing all of the concerns. But what I'm saying is we already know what they're going to do before they do it. So it's kind of like playing a game where this is how they're gonna steal the election. And then we can take measures to prevent them from stealing it. So you're 100% right, people should be vigilant, people should be concerned. This is why Trump supporters came out and voted in such high numbers so that it wouldn't even be a close election in these battleground states. But again, Trump's people and the GOP, as much as we might not like the GOP establishment, they are aware of what is going on, and they know what to look for. Okay, and we're going to get your take on Trump's initial moves. Obviously, Mitt Romney still floating around as a potential Secretary of State. You said that that could potentially be a line in the sand for you. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into Richard Spencer and this attempt by the mainstream media to basically end the alt-right or to redefine it. Mike Cernovich is our guest. This is The Alex Jones Show Live. We'll be right back. Breaking news at Infowars.com. We are back on The Alex Jones Show with Mike Cernovich, our guest, who has basically been characterized on many occasions as one of the top election influencers, especially via his Twitter account. Obviously, he does Periscope video broadcasts as well, which are extremely popular. But again, named over and over again as one of the top election influencers uh, by the mainstream media, also attacked relentlessly, like all of us are, by the mainstream media. But what we're going to get into now is this issue with Richard Spencer. Now, this is an individual who we actually supported, or at least defended, back a few days ago when CNN came out and said that Richard Spencer, who is like a young David Duke-style character, he was one of the individuals who coined the term alt-right. Here you see the footage we're playing of the conference that he headed up last weekend where members of his audience started giving Sieg Heil Nazi salutes. And you see the 
rabid enthusiasm with which they do those salutes during this conference, this was immediately capitalized on by the mainstream media who were invited into that conference to basically recharacterize the entire alt-right as this fringe neo-Nazi white supremacist element, taking that element and making that define the entirety of the alt-right. We defended this individual, I think it was on Monday, CNN said that in this speech he came out and said that Jews aren't people. Well, if you watch his speech, he wasn't talking about Jews when he made that comment. He was talking about the mainstream media, and basically that was a complete hoax. He never said that. We also defended this individual when the editor of Politico a few days ago came out and encouraged people to attack him with a baseball bat. Okay, so we defend his right to free speech, which doesn't mean we have to agree with it. But Mike, we've got plenty of time to flesh this out. Just explain to the audience who this Richard Spencer is and what happened at this conference last weekend. Well, the first question, or my first comment is in the form of a rhetorical question. Why is The Atlantic producing a documentary on Richard Spencer? Why is the left-wing fake news media spending millions of dollars to build up and promote Richard's brand. Meanwhile, I've been no platform and banned from television. You, the only time they want to talk to you is to try to attack you. So why is it that in an era of no platforming, where the norm for the fake news media is to just say, these voices are too powerful, they're too persuasive, they're too compelling, we cannot have their voices grow bigger. They want to ban us, but they want to do a documentary on Richard Spencer. Why do you think that is, Paul? Well, it's because you've made the point before. I mean, we've created our own platforms. We don't need edited, deceptively put out mainstream media hit pieces to try and get our message across. I mean, I'm doing 250 million Twitter impressions a month. You've got hundreds of thousands of YouTube views. You're the same with your Twitter, your Periscopes. We don't have to rely on the mainstream media to get our message out. Now, Richard Spencer is a guy, obviously I'd heard of him, I knew of his name. I didn't even know what he looked like, let's be honest, until a week ago. You go to his YouTube channel, he's got like 4,000 views on his videos. You know, I can upload a YouTube video, and again, this is not bragging, I'm making the point that we resonate. I can upload a YouTube video and it gets 4,000 views within five minutes. Yet these people struggle to get it over the course of months and months. So the question is, why are they giving them so much attention now? Why is right, The exactly. Atlantic making an entire documentary on this individual and on this group? And in the aftermath of this, this is what we've seen, even people on 4chan, and they're not exactly known for being that sensitive about political correctness. Even people like Paul Ramsey have come out in the aftermath and said that giving Sig Heil salutes in front of the mainstream media and, you know, they can claim it's the Roman salute. I mean, it doesn't really matter at this point. You know, we know you're neo-Nazis. You might as well just embrace it. They flip from being proud of it to saying, oh, no, it's not a Sig Heil. But they give these salutes in front of the mainstream media. No matter how you splice it, that is terrible optics. And as you said, that gives the mainstream media an instant victory. This is why Trump had to come out immediately and, quote, disavow the alt-right. I mean, from my perspective, he was just disavowing this particular tiny vocal fringe minority of the alt-right. But in the aftermath, it's caused this kind of fissure where now respectable people who resonated, who had success, who won the argument, who got Trump elected, are now having to distance themselves from this fringe radical group, correct? Right. I could, I could make a, a periscope of me drinking a cup of coffee <laughs> and I'm going to get more views than Richard Spencer. And yet the, the fake news media is saying Richard Spencer is the leader of this movement. He is the man. He is everything. Well, if he were, why doesn't he have readership? Why doesn't he actually have an organic platform? Why doesn't he have his own following? He's very marginal. So what the media has done as a way to discredit Trump and as a way to discredit you, Alex Jones, me, Roger Stone, the real freedom fighters, they're building They're him up. the leader. We'll be back. Whoa, whoa, Hold that whoa. thought. Mike Cernovich will be right back. Stay tuned. We are live with Mike Cernovich, DangerAndPlay.com. So what basically happened was the mainstream media invited this white supremacist group, or at least basically invited them for a documentary, said, we're making a documentary, The Atlantic. It's coming out next month. We want to attend your conference to hear your message. 
And it's the same thing that I get basically every other day now from the mainstream media. They're all polite and friendly with you up front. Oh, it's not going to be a hit piece. Oh, no. Of course, when you actually do it, it's a massive hit piece. They edit you. They make you look ridiculous. That's why, unless it's live, I don't talk to the mainstream media. I don't play their game because I don't need them. We've got our own massive platform. We are the media. We don't need the fake news media. So they basically got a bunch of people to do Sieg Heil Nazi salutes at this, quote, alt-right conference, put it out there immediately, put the video out. It went completely viral, over 2 million views, showed it to Trump. Basically, he had to disavow the, quote, alt-right because they framed these, what, 50 to 60 individuals as being the alt-right. And you can see how truly demented they look as they run up to the stage enthusiastically Sieg Heiling. They're encouraging other people to do this Nazi salute, and, you know, whether they were provocateurs or not. Some of them probably were. Well, don't allow provocateurs, infiltrators to come to your event. That's stupid to begin with. But as you can see, it wasn't just a few people. And there was, there was a story that came out after which said, oh, it was this half Jewish person. That was the only person doing the Sig Heil salute. Wrong. There's at least 12, 14, 15 people in that crowd doing this Sig Heil salute. So the mainstream media came out and said, Trump has to disavow the alt-right. Trump saw this video. He subsequently disavowed the alt-right. So then, of course, you had the big alt-right drama that spilled out over Twitter with, you know, myself, Cernovich, Molyneux, all kinds of other people. And they came out and said, well, you're just virtue signaling to the mainstream media. You're just virtue signaling to the left by disavowing yourself from this group. And again, do you really think I need to virtue signal to the mainstream media to get attention because I want to be on friendly terms with them? You know, I turn down their requests every single day because I don't need them. I don't need to play their game. So it's not us that's colluding with the mainstream media when we disavow from a group that literally worships Hitler. I mean, that's not really good optics, is it? That doesn't resonate with the American people. That's not what won Trump the election. So, Mike, you know, it's them that are colluding with the mainstream media. They need the platform. They invited the snakes into the den, the mainstream media, and the mainstream media got exactly what they wanted, right? Yeah, I believe, I believe the photo op was staged. I believe it was planned and that it was, to, it was a quid pro quo. So Richard gets millions of dollars in free media coverage. He gets a free documentary about himself. And then wink, wink, nod, nod, he writes, hail Trump. And the provocateurs get up and do the Roman salute. That was the reason I, the reason I distanced myself especially is because, well, a number of reasons. One is it's folly, folly beyond, beyond measure. Another reason is why did Richard bring Trump's name into it, right? There's a lot of questions that intelligent people would ask. And as you know, I'm a lawyer. So part of my job was to uncover when people are lying to me. Why would Richard Spencer invite the Atlantic in there with cameras and then mention hail Trump and then have people come up and do the Roman salute or Nazi salute, whatever you want to call it. That's just a little bit too perfect. Doesn't it seem a little bit too perfect to you? Like a, like a photo op is how I view it. Yeah, and you could actually see the most demented one in this video, which we've been rolling while we've been talking about this. The one who ran up to the front of the stage in another clip, he goes to somebody else in the crowd and basically sees them doing this Sig Heil Nazi salute and encourages them to do it again. So absolutely bizarre frothing at the mouth behavior it looks absolutely terrible. They demonize themselves. And any sane, reasonable person would, have, would want to have nothing to do with this. I mean, uh, Ramsey Paul, I think Rams Paul on Twitter came out and said basically the same thing. And he's, again, he's not someone who's really concerned with being politically correct. Let's just put it that way. But again, this goes to the heart of my point, which is, you know, there's a difference between drawing attention to something like anti-white racism, which happens every day. You know, we have hate crimes against white people. We had one with the Trump supporter being beaten up just a little over a week ago that got no news attention. We have that going on, but there's a difference between pointing that out and saying that's wrong and saying it should be discouraged. There's a difference between arguing that multiculturalism has failed and it's detrimental. There's a difference between all of that and actually being and acting like a neo-Nazi. So any sane, reasonable person would want to distance themselves from that. And it comes down to the fact, 
you know, this neo-Nazi strain of the alt-right, whatever you want to call it, they're the far-right version of social justice warriors. They're obsessed with identity politics. I'm more concerned about issues that resonate with people and identity politics doesn't. It's completely failed. Even Bernie Sanders admitted that identity politics was what cost Democrats the election. So why should we embroil ourselves in this bizarre identity politics game when it's proven to be a failure, when what we've proven to, done, to, to have done over the past year has completely resonated with the American people and it's basically got Trump into the White House? Right, exactly. And that is, again, why I view it as a photo op and sabotage. We kicked the media's butt the entire year and a half. We showed them you don't have any power, you don't have any influence, you can't rig the election for Hillary. We kicked their butt for a year and a half. And then what happens? This perfect little photo op that gives the fake news media a big victory, the first victory it's had for over a year. Again, that is why people say, Mike, you're, you know, there's a rule that goes something like never punch to the right. And the idea is that on the left, you're not going to hear them disavow people like Black Lives Matter, et cetera. I'm sympathetic to that view. I'm sympathetic to the view that, hey, if people want to be morons, there's enough people on the left we got to take out. Rather than fight with the fringe elements on the right, I would rather take on the fake news media and bring them down. However, I don't view any of this stuff that happened at NPI as being political activism. I view it as being a false flag orchestrated by the media because it was simply too perfect. The photo op is too beautiful. The Atlantic was invited there to do a documentary, and they got exactly what they wanted to get. So this, again, is an issue of um, there are always going to be saboteurs in our movement. As you know, most actual neo-Nazis have always been federal informants, Hal Turner, Many people like that have been actual informants, and that is what they do. So that whole 1488, and for you, for the listeners who don't really know, that's kind of the, the nickname for the neo-Nazis. There aren't actually very many neo-Nazis. Most of them are provocateurs who are paid by, well, we know for a fact that Hillary Clinton has had a super PAC of trolls called the Correct the Record, and that organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center do have people troll and agitate and pretend to be these neo-Nazis in order to keep people afraid and to create divide and conquer. So as of right now, that neo-Nazi organization, NPI, I don't even view them as a legitimate organization. They're just another tool of the left. No, exactly. I mean, you mentioned Hal Turner. I remember when Hal Turner was attacking us years before he was revealed to be an FBI informant. And that's not a conspiracy, folks. It came out in court that Hal Turner was on the FBI payroll. He was being paid to act like a neo-Nazi and to make conservative opinion, to make Infowars look bad. That came out. That's all admitted. You can look at Germany. Over 10 years ago, it came out that the entire upper echelons of the neo-Nazi movement in Germany was completely run by the German federal government. Okay, they've got history on this. And again, this plays perfectly into the mainstream media narrative. They're saying, oh, fake news was what won Donald Trump the election. The KKK, the neo-Nazis in the alt-right, was what won Donald Trump the election. Even though, like the KKK, this National Policy Institute is so tiny. I mean, you can look at the people just in that crowd. It's literally 50 to 60 people. Compare that to the massive, you know, tens of thousands of people at Trump rallies. This is a tiny movement but it plays into their narrative to say, these are the people who elected Trump. This is what we have to fight back against. Then it legitimizes all the people out rioting in the streets. It legitimizes this recount. It legitimizes opposition to Trump. If this can all be pinned on neo-Nazis and they can say this is what got Trump elected. It's completely false, Mike. We know what got Trump elected was, you know, hardworking Americans in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, they voted for Trump because they want their jobs back. You know, people in Arizona, people in Texas, they voted for Trump because they want to stop illegal immigration. They voted on the policies, not because someone emailed them a link to a two-hour documentary on Holocaust denial. They voted on the policies, right? Yet the mainstream media tries to make it all about this tiny fringe group of neo-Nazis. Exactly. As an example, I had an election night party in Huntington Beach, California. I put up one or two tweets about the party. I didn't announce it in advance. I had 100 people show up. 
I can get more people based on one or two tweets to just come hang out with no notice given than this think tank can have by advertising, promoting, holding an official event, mentioning it months in advance, really hyping it up. I could just send a tweet right now and say, hey, we're going to go hang out and get fish tacos in Hermosa Beach, California. More people are actually going to show up than went to that NPI neo-Nazi talk or whatever it was. But again, the big picture, and you and I know this, but a lot of your listeners might not fully appreciate it, that the globalists behind the media are also behind a lot of these so-called alt-right people. They want to fund it because it's a great way to attack us. It's very hard to attack Paul Joseph Watson. It's very hard to attack Alex Jones. It's very hard to attack Mike Cernan, Stephen Molyneux. It's very, very hard to, to, get, to get after us. So what they do is they create a caricature. They build up a brand. And then they use that person to attack everybody using the left. They love guilt by association tactics. That is what they're trying to do. And I'm not going to allow it. That is why I spoke up and I made sure the lines are clear. If people want to be 1488 little neo-Nazis, fine. I'm not going to argue with them every day. I'm not going to, you know, debate them. I have other things to do with my time, but I don't want them anywhere near me. But it's very seductive if you're in their movement and you're basically lazy and you have no audience to allow the Atlantic and the mainstream media to give you all this vaunted, you know, prestige. I mean, we were in the... We were in the trenches all year, you know, on social media, making these videos, putting out these articles, reaching out to people, and we resonated. They don't want to make us the kings of the alt-right, do they? No, they go to this weird, creepy little neo-Nazi group who's giving sick hells, and suddenly, oh, they're the new leaders of the alt-right. That means they elected Trump. It's complete nonsense. And again, look at the history of who funds, who controls these neo-Nazi groups. In fact, several of these neo-Nazi websites who now say they're the alt-right were against the alt-right when it started. So again, a lot of people have said that even these websites are being funded by the feds and they have history with Hal Turner. But let's move on because we've got about, let me see, four or five minutes left in this segment. Pizzagate, okay? This is not something I've really covered that much. We have laws in the UK where they track your entire... Uh, browsing history for a year and use it in criminal cases against you. People have been banned on Twitter for this because it's some very disturbing stuff. And it's quite hideous to contemplate. I mean, let's be honest. The New York Times came out, said it was fake news, which, you know, actually gives it more credibility because they're fake news. But Mike, walk us through it. What's the argument being made here with Pizzagate? Right. Pizzagate is an interesting story because there's a lot there, but what is there we don't really know yet. And the media is trying to, fake news media is trying to shut down the investigation before it starts. So there's this pizza part. This, the reason it's called Pizzagate is because there's a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., where a lot of people think there's a pedophile ring being run out of it. I'm not really quite sure um, what is going on. What I do know is that there's been a lot of creepy pictures there was a picture of where a child's hands were taped to the table with some kind of weird caption like, um, isn't this cute or whatever. I, I personally don't view um, restraining a child on a table to be adorable at, at all in any way. So there's a, the creep factor of the people who run this pizza parlor is very high. Tony Podesta, who's a political fix fixer in D.C., this is all true, too. When I tell people this, they go, this is a conspiracy. I go, you can find this article 10 years ago. Tony Podesta, John Podesta's brother, who John Podesta, of course, was Clinton's campaign chair. Tony Podesta and John, uh, you know, political fixers in D.C. Tony Podesta has to watch movies in an underground dungeon. Now, people go, Mike, you're... Conspiracy. Go, you can, they call it a subterranean basement, right? So Tony, they, they said that the Podesta family are into art that is so um, shocking that they have to watch it underground. So people start to think, well, wait a minute, in what world do you need to go to an underground bunker to watch movies? What is actually going on there? And then, of course, all of the Podestas are tied to Jeffrey Epstein, who had that temple on his, his pedophile island. He had the big temple, and the temple also had an underground dungeon, which again can be verified from drone footage. But the media doesn't want to talk about um, anything like that. They don't want to, we, all, we know there are pedophiles in Hollywood. 
We know that Dennis Hastert, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, was a pedophile. Again, that's a verifiable fact. So all of these kind of seemingly unrelated people and unrelated events are kind of coming together. And whether it's really based out of that pizza parlor, I'm not entirely sure. But there is a pedophile ring in the District of Columbia. There are massive amounts of pedophiles in Hollywood, massive amounts of pedophiles in the New York Times and in the fake news media. And that is why they are so adamant about fighting Pizzagate rather than investigate it. They immediately want to discredit it, just like the fake news media said Hillary Clinton's health was a conspiracy theory. And then she fainted on 9-11, which, of course, you remember. Um, I think VigilantCitizen.com, is, they've got a good summary of this Pizzagate story, which you can look at without, you know, fearing that what you see might be too disturbing. But this, this guy who runs it, and I'm, you know, there's a lot of things. The daycare child abuse phenomenon, for example, back in the, I think it was the 80s and 90s, that was a case of mass hysteria, and it does tend to circulate around these child abuse scandals. But what we know for sure is that this pizza place is completely bizarre. They've got weird artwork on the walls. The owner on his Instagram page is constantly sharing images of children and then making sexual references in these images of children. Again, you've got spirit cooking. You've got that whole thing within the WikiLeaks emails. It's absolutely bizarre. What we don't want to see is these people being harassed when there's no actual concrete evidence that they're doing something illegal. But I would not want to take my children to that pizza parlor that's been at the center of this Pizzagate scandal. It's very bizarre. It's very creepy. And given the, you know, the level of the power of the people who are involved in this and the fact that in almost every single major worldwide pedophile scandal, it always leads back to top judges, police chiefs, actors and politicians, the elite. Every single time in every country, that's the case. We'll be back with Mike Cernovich on The Alex Jones Show live, Infowars.com. Don't go away. We are back live on The Alex Jones Show with Mike Cernovich. Going to do about 10 more minutes with Mike. He is the author of Gorilla Mindset and MAGA Mindset. The website is DangerAndPlay.com. Want to get Mike's take on this. The Washington Post reports today, Russian propaganda effort helped spread fake news during election, experts say. So again, it's the establishment's complete obsession, their conspiracy theory that the Kremlin is behind absolutely everything. Now they've got Infowars, they've got Zero Hedge on a list of fake news websites, but not just fake news, fake news controlled by Vladimir Putin, controlled by the Kremlin. Of course, no evidence whatsoever for it. And as Mike mentioned back about 20 minutes ago, the progenitor of fake news in this election cycle was Hillary Clinton. They had paid trolls as far back as March and April operating on behalf of Hillary Clinton to, quote, counteract narratives, spread fake news in support of Hillary Clinton. So months before this fake news narrative came out, and I mean, let's be honest, there are fake news websites. They're pretty easy to spot. But Hillary Clinton was the progenitor of fake news. You know, 41% of Hillary Clinton's Twitter followers are completely fake. 41%, that's huge. And again, the mainstream media blazed the trail when it came to fake news. I mean, they only have themselves to blame. You know, fake polls, fake narratives about Hillary having a 98% chance of winning you know, fake rape cases across the country, fake Brian Williams fairy tales about being hit by an RPG in Iraq, you know, Dan Rather's fake Air National Guard documents. They are the kingpins of fake news. Now they're complaining about fake news and saying, oh, it's all controlled by the Kremlin. Mike, what's the end game of this fake news narrative? Is it just about internet censorship? Oh, 100%. This is, this is a real threat. The fake news attack... Um, actually concerns me far more than this Jill Stein false flag operation. Here's what happened this election. The fake news media, like the New York Times, which is owned by Carlos Slim, who is a monopolist in Mexico, has robbed the country, the poor Mexicans, of billions of people. You'll never read about that in the New York Times. These little private bloggers are furious that people like you and I had a massive impact on the election and they want to get us off the grid because we are more powerful and we are more trusted 
than the fake news media is. They want to get our websites de-indexed from Google. They want to get us banned from Facebook. They want to get us banned from Twitter. Moreover, fake news is actually tied in to that neo-Nazi salute stuff. So the fake news media, the reason they're giving those neo-Nazis coverage is because then the fake news media can say, oh, look, actually, Paul Joseph Watson, Mike Cernovich, Alex Jones, Stefan Molyneux, these guys are all part of this little neo-Nazi movement. They should be banned and deplatformed. That is the end game. It's all connected. They really are furious that they are no longer able to influence public decision making. Because, again, think about someone like you. If you didn't have a platform, you would become a slave to the fake news media. You would have to repeat their talking points or else you would not be allowed on television. But that is why when you go on CNN, everybody kind of has the same talking points. There isn't a real difference between right wing and left wing. It's all globalist talking points. The fake news media, they're losing power. They're losing influence. So they're going to come after us hard. They're going to try to censor the internet hard. That's one reason reason Obama signed over the internet to the UN. That's another potential end run um, around the First Amendment in the United States. So fake news right now, that whole story is one of the biggest threats to free speech today. I mean, it's amazing. I was looking last night. BBC News has 27 million Twitter followers. I've got about 373,000. I get more retweets than BBC News. You get more retweets than BBC News. We're resonating, we're winning, they're losing. That's why they're falling back on this fake news when they're the fake news. We'll be back with Mike Cernovich, stay tuned. Just wanted to mention this um, Washington Post article. This is a quote from this Washington Post article that claims Infowars is a fake news outlet run by the Kremlin, quote, this propaganda machinery also helped push the phony story that anti-Trump protesters were paid thousands of dollars to participate in demonstrations. That was James O'Keefe and Project Veritas. They were on tape admitting that they paid crazy people to go and start violence at Trump rallies. That wasn't fake news. That wasn't even Infowars reporting it. That was a videotape secretly obtained and published. Again, another one of these fake news stories they claimed was Hillary Clinton's health. In fact, many mainstream media outlets had to apologize to us for not treating the concerns about Hillary Clinton's health seriously after she collapsed on September 11th. But again, they're going with this narrative. We just got a couple of minutes left here, Mike. Uh, final comments and tell people how they can find you on Twitter and where they can get your books. All right, final comments. The big hot story is fake news. Don't fall for it. Be on guard. Recognize that these big multi-billion dollar corporations are getting their butt kicked. That is why they're so desperate. That is why, while we must remain vigilant, always be on guard against the enemy, because we are against some very dark, even some might say demonic forces. Know that we are winning, and that is why they are afraid. So we should be really excited. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. Every day I wake up, and I think, I can't wait to get to work bringing truthful news and information to the people, and I bet you feel that way too, Paul. So my message to the people is keep sharing articles. Don't ever let the fake news media tell you that you don't matter. This election showed that you matter. What can you do? Not everybody is, wants to be a big media star, and that's great. Not everybody wants to run a media company. That's great. What you can do, share articles on social media. Correct your friends. When they refer to something as fake news, let them know that the only fake news they're gonna find is on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post. As for finding me, you can find me at twitter.com forward slash C-E-R-N-O-V-I-C-H. I have a book on Donald Trump, why he won, that is on Amazon, and I actually published the book before Trump won. That's how confident I was that he was gonna win, and that's called MAGA Mindset, Making You an America Great Again. That's on Amazon. But be inspired, people. It is a great day to be alive. I'm, I'm so excited, as Paul is too. Okay, there goes Mike Cernovich, dangerandplay.com.